coming up on the Q30 newscast. See how many students are using the gym facilities on campus now that the mask mandate has been lifted. The Island Hunger Museum found a new home inside of Connecticut. And see how the university is honoring Women's History Month through teach-ins. All that and much more coming on Q30 newscast. Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of the Q30 Newscast. I'm Katie Cohen. And I'm Keith Savage. We have a lot of news to get today, so let's get started. Since the mask mandate has been modified to only include classrooms and large university events, have more students been using the fitness facilities? Olivia Cattell went to the fitness center on the Mount Carmel campus to get the answer. I'm here at the Mount Carmel Athletic Facility where students and employees no longer have to wear masks indoors. The relaxed mask requirements are being embraced across campus, including in the athletic facilities. I would say the biggest change I've seen, um, other than just the, the slight increase in students, is everyone's much happier to be coming to our facility now. Um, my student staff are much happier to come to work. All the students that come in to work out are much happier. Um, and I'll add that I'm much happier to come in here not having to, um, to yell at students for masks. Students using the facilities are in support of abandoning masks during their workouts. I'm glad that we don't have to wear masks anymore only because in a hot gym like that, when there's over 20 people, everyone's working out, everyone's sweaty, and having to cover your nose and mouth, not having like, the ability to fully breathe with the constraint of the mask. Some people got like, overheated. I got tired a lot easier, and so just no more mask means like, no, I won't get tired, some people won't get like, as overheated, and it's just safer. This semester has already seen many students coming to the athletic center, and John Summers believes that the new guidance could help continue the trend. Um, and we haven't dropped below 3,000 students a week at this, at this campus this semester, um, which is pretty incredible. Historically speaking, we're somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 students a week here. Um, so I definitely think um, the lifting of the mask mandate helped, but um, I think there's just more interest, um, especially with the, uh, the new Wreck and Wellness Center being built right now. Um, a lot of students are just seeing more of our program, seeing more of what we have to offer, um, and they're getting really excited for that next year as well. For Q30 News, I'm Olivia Cattell. Thank you, Olivia. Let's take a look at the COVID-19 numbers across campus, and they may surprise you. As of Monday, March 7th, there are 16 active cases on campus, all of which are from the last seven days. This is a decrease from last week's 29 cases, even after the university lifted the mask mandate to only include classrooms and large events. The Quinnipiac a cappella team, the Legends, won first place in their Northeast quarterfinal, ICCAs. This is the first time they've ever played in the competition since they started five years ago. The team also won best vocal per percussion and best choreography in the competition. They now move on to the semifinals later this month. Here's a clip of their performance in the quarterfinals. You used to drown on my crazy Just by the touch of your hand We used to stay up forever Just to make every moment last Island's Great Hungry Museum, currently located on Winnie Avenue, is getting a new home just down the road in Fairfield. Matt Gerontic spoke to the university and the Gaelic American Club about this chance and all of the recent information. On Friday, Quinnipiac University announced that its Ireland Great Hunger Museum will be moving to Fairfield. In a partnership with the Gaelic American Club of Fairfield, the museum will serve as the new location for where the collection will be displayed. The news came with mixed emotions from the public. However, Daryl Richard points out that the collection is going to be in good hands. One of the things that we're most grateful for is the fact that we're going to be able to keep the collection intact here in Connecticut and now cared for by the Irish American community via the Gaelic American Club. With the collection moving to the Fairfield area, John Foley is confident that the move will not only help preserve the rich Irish history it has, but the emotional aspect it conveys. The Great Hunger is something that connects deeply with, with us. It's something that you, you, it, you can't describe. And I think the, the, the museum touches something in us that we haven't fully, fully um, embraced. You know, it's something that we, 
we haven't talked about. We haven't. It's a it's a trauma that is deep within us. Despite the relocation, the university will continue to support the collection and continue to fund the academic and research programs for the Hunger Museum, the collection inside the Arnold Bernhard Library, and educational activities related to Ireland. The Gaelic American Club is considered one of the largest Irish American clubs across the United States, with more than 6,000 members. As for the Hunger Museum itself, the university intends to repurpose this location. However, nothing has currently been discussed. Reporting live from the Lender Collection Room, Matthew Jaroncic, Q30 News. The Student Government Association's Steering Committee proposed eight new amendments to the Constitution last week during their open forum. Among these amendments are a change to the SGA's mission statement, implementation of a Vice President of Operations, with a new set of responsibilities on the executive board, reducing the size of the Senate, changing the Judicial and Ethics Board to contain five justices and no senior justices. As you may have noticed, gas prices around the state are dramatically increasing. Since Ukraine has been invaded by Russia, the prices of gas have skyrocketed across the state and the country. The average cost per, ga cost per gallon in Connecticut is $4.42. This is the highest ever recorded record in the state. Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal announced a new bill that would lower the gas prices temporarily by suspending the federal gas tax until the end of this year. It's time for our first break, but still to come, we have information on Women's History Month events on campus, how students, faculty, and staff are impacted. And we have political updates from Carly McManus with some news straight from Washington, D.C. But first, we have a quick look at the weather for the next few days from Olivia Berrios-Johnson. Olivia, what do you have for us? Thank you, Katie and Keith. So looking at the three-day forecast, on today we had some snow with temperatures at 38 degrees. On Thursday, we are anticipating a cloudy day with temperatures at 51 degrees and finishing off the week with temperatures at 52 degrees and also partly cloudy. Stay tuned for more of your seven-day forecast after the break. What do you think you're doing, Kevin? I uh, was just gonna drive home. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, there are several warning signs present that you shouldn't be driving. Like hearing voices? Like your text to emoji ratio? Oh man, the selfies. <laughs> Selfie nailed it. We all have warning signs that let us know that we're probably not okay to drive. Mine is pretending to be your subconscious. Craig, come on man, let's put a ride home. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a unique mix of all kinds of things. Come on, Joe, spot on this last one. Uh, there it is. Keep going with it. Leo! <laughs> they're a little bit of a lot of things but they're all pure love. Thanks for sticking with us. The last equity report was published last year and many changes were made to the bias reporting plan. Hepsar Rajan sat down with the staff of Diversity and Inclusion Department about these changes. Quinnipiac University's first Equity and Inclusion report was released in the spring semester last year. Vice President for Equity and Inclusion Don Sawyer says the goal of the report was to ensure students were aware of new initiatives. It wasn't just meant to say, hey, look at what we did, but it was saying, look at what we, we are doing. This is the work that we need to continue to do in order to improve, and we're going to be giving uh, community updates as we go along so people can see the work that's actually being done. Sawyer says that there has been a lot of changes made to the online report since then, including the new equity and inclusion web page. There was really no, no resource on the web um, in order for us to kind of show what, what we were doing. Having the website 
um, and continuing to build the website. That's that's a major improvement. One of the goals on the 10 point plan is improving bias reporting services. As part of that, a new position was introduced within the Title IX office. Last October, we hired a civil rights um, and Title IX investigator in addition to myself. So now we have two uh, staff members in the office um, helping to address you know, student concerns when it comes to bias related um, and Title IX uh, issues. Quartang says that trainings and conversations have helped as they see an increase in the number of cases reported on campus. And we did start to see an increase in reporting. Now it doesn't necessarily mean that there was an increase of incidents happening. It just meant that people felt more comfortable to bring forward their concerns. Center, students were able to share their personal business successes with the university. Ten students were selling their products ranging from jewelry, clothing, pasta sauce, baked goods, and sports supplements. Those business owners enjoyed sharing their passions with the rest of the student body on campus and had the opportunity to sell their products to others. Quinnipiac announced that they will be offering a faculty-led Women's World Cup course during the spring 2023 semester. Dr. Molly Gannity and Dr. Hillary Hildane will be running the class under, under COM 340. The group will be traveling to the Women's World Cup in Sydney, Australia from July 22nd to August 3rd in 2023. Last year, it came, all came together for us. We got to talking about the class again and decided to do it on soccer. So COM 340, exploring women's sports and media coverage abroad, will explore media landscapes, women issues, the sports cultures of the qualifying nations, and historical and contemporary issues in Australia and New Zealand, Dr. Dr. Yanity said. Yesterday, there was a women's teach-in honoring women in leadership who are changing the world. Presentations took place all day on a variety of different themes, topics such as sexual violence, women in sports, indigenous women and black women, and even more were discussed. Q30's Olivia Berrios-Johnson spoke to sociology and women gender studies professor Lauren Sardi about her contribution to the event. I notice a lot of the, um, the issues, you know, that are going to be talked about uh, today um, in a very real way. It's part of my lived experience as a woman. Um, and it's part of my lived experience as a woman who is also dealing um, with other folks in leadership positions as well as being in one myself. Earlier today, the Department of Cultural and Global Engagement held an inclusive conversation about gender equity and inclusion. They held the call on Zoom and talked about the importance of Women's History Month. Domine talked about what women and non-binary people have contributed to America. The group also acknowledged the struggles that women still go through. This is a part of a new training program series by DCGE. The next conversation will be Thursday and will be about the 50th anniversary of Title IX. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill have been busy trying to pass a government funding package to help Ukraine and Vice President Kamala Harris is making her way down to Poland to meet with Ukrainian refugees. Carly McManus is in the studio to give us all the recent political updates. Thanks guys. To start off this week on Capitol Hill, Vice President Harris traveled to Eastern Europe today to meet with many Ukrainians who have fled the country since the invasion started two weeks ago. Harris plans on meeting with the Polish president and other allied officials, such as Justin Trudeau, in Warsaw, Poland, this upcoming Thursday. Around 2 million Ukrainians have fled the country as of this Tuesday. Following the invasion, Poland is housing around 1.2 million refugees, according to the new information provided by the United Nations. Harris also plans on visiting the active border, where the troops are stationed in Romania. Biden officials hinted that this week there might be an extension on the student loan payment freeze. The Education Department has announced that there is a growing potential that they will be notifying companies that manage federal students on loans to hold off on sending their required notices to borrowers about the payments. This suggested that pandemic relief saves student borrowers around $5 billion in interest each, each month. White House officials Ron Klain stated that last week such extensions was under consideration by the Biden administration. Lawmakers have reached a $1.5 trillion bipartisan deal for the government funding amid what's going on in, the, in Ukraine right now. The GOP looked for a $42 billion increase that would be allocated to budget defense with another 14 in emergency funding to boost the humanitarian, security, and economic aid for Ukraine. 
Other European allies helping Ukraine and additional 15 billion in COVID-19 associated funding are also included in this bill. There's hope that lawmakers will have this package passed by this upcoming Friday or Saturday. The House is expected to take, take action on this within the next few days. That's all that's happening in politics. Those are all the stories we have for today. Thank you, Carly. It's time for our next break. Let's stick with us because we have information on a letter sent from religious leader, leaders on campus and how religious life is attempting to help with overseas conflict. And Lauren Clemens is here to give us a national update including a new controversial bill in Florida that recently passed in the Senate. We'll be right back. Meet the scan, a simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. but I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at savebythescan.org. I think it's just vapor with flavor. It won't hurt my kid like cigarettes, right? Vaping is safer than smoking, isn't it? There's really not even that much nicotine in them, right? My kid? My kid? My kid knows it's dangerous. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping, maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. I don't think that many kids in my son's school even do it. He makes fun of his friend who vapes. He would never try it. She's in the soccer. She's on the honor roll. She's just on the tight. No way. No way. No way. No way. My kid would never vape. Get your head out of the cloud. Today, nearly 8,000 kids will start vaping. Maybe even yours. Learn about the dangers at talkaboutvaping.org. Meet the scan. A simple procedure whose mission is to detect lung cancer early. but I feel fine. That's great, but you may still be at high risk for lung cancer. Oh man, that's a new fence. If you smoke, early detection could save your life. Learn more at savebythescan.org. Thank you for sticking with us. Keith, I personally did not like the weather today with all the snow and wind, and I know we are both from Massachusetts and used to the snow, but it is still not my favorite. Me personally, I love the snow, but Olivia Barrios Johnson is here to give us the full weather for the rest of the week and into the start of the spring break. Olivia, what do you have for us tonight? Hey everyone, so let's take a look at the weather in the state of Connecticut for the upcoming week. We have our temperatures ranging from the mid-30s with 32 in Burlington, 35 in Hartford, and a high of 36 in New Haven. So if you're not taking that spring break trip to Miami where it'll be sunny and hot and you're staying in Connecticut, make sure you continue to wear those winter coats because it still will be a little chilly outside. Thank you. And now looking at the seven day forecast, we have Wednesday and Thursday and Friday with temperatures at 38, 51 and 52 degrees. Today we did experience some snow, but looking into our spring break weekend, we have Saturday with some rain at a temperature of 51 degrees. And looking into Sunday, we have a high of 38 with sunshine. So don't be fooled. It's still going to be a little bit cold. And then looking into Monday and Tuesday, our temperatures will also be within the 50s. So it will be a little bit warmer uh, at the start of the next week and for your spring break vacation. Have a great break, everyone. Thank you, Liv. Quinnipiac recently ranked number nine in the country for the top private military friendly universities that offer doctoral degrees. This is just another award to be given to the Military and Veterans Affairs Department. The university will be featured in GI Jobs magazine in May. I talked to Jason Burke, the Director of Military and Veteran Affairs, about how the university has reached this achievement and many others. Well, it's really, you know, a testament to how our leadership, our faculty and staff support our veterans, all the support pieces that are in place like counseling services, uh, the learning commons to help our uh, student veterans and really them too, that really, you know, focusing on the mission of 
of their academics. Quinnipiac's religious leaders released an open letter on Thursday talking about their invasion of Ukraine by Russian military forces. The group spoke about how social media platforms like YouTube and TikTok have a pivotal role in showing the chaos for the first time in history. Later in, letter, later in the letter, the religious leaders stated they are here to help Russian and Ukrainian Bobcat students who are going through difficult times. Hannah Merksey talked to Father Jordan Lettingham and staff chaplain for Catholic Life, Joshim Kenny, about how they're going to go into the Poland-Ukrainian border to help the refugees. It's easy to sort of turn a reading of statistics about this many wounded, this many dead, this much destroyed into just sort of recitations of numbers. But what has struck me is that behind every one of those numbers, there is an individual human life. All of it now is, is gone or lost. With the ever-changing situation in Europe, there are many impacts on the United States. Lauren Clemens is here to give us an update on what is happening around the country. Thank you, Katie and Keith. What's happening with the oil prices amidst the conflict in Ukraine? The U.S. became the first Western country to ban Russian energy imports. After Biden put out other sanctions on Russia, the United Kingdom followed this by announcing it will phase out use of Russian oil by the end of the year. According to Eurostat, Europe relies on Russia for about 40 percent of its energy supply compared to the U.S., which depends on Russia for less than 10 percent of its oil imports. Gas prices have reached record levels, with national average being $4.09, according to AAA. President Biden has pledged to do what he can to relieve the economic impact while also warning energy companies not to price gouge. Looking to a recently passed Florida bill, opponents are calling the Don't Say Gay bill. On March 8th, the Florida State Senate passed a bill called the Parental Rights and Education Bill that prohibits classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in the state's primary schools. Supporters of the bill say it's about allowing parents to have control over their children's education, while opponents say it unfairly targets the LGBTQ plus community. The measure bans classroom instructions by school personnel or third parties on sexual orientation or gender identity in kindergarten through third grade. Parents can, school, parents can sue school districts for alleged violations. For the final national story of the night, a shooting that happened at a high school on Monday in Iowa. Six teenagers between the ages of 14 and 17 were arrested and charged with a count of murder and two counts of attempted murder following a drive-by shooting outside East High School in Des Moines, Iowa that left one teenager dead and two others in the hospital. Gunshots were fired by multiple shooters from multiple vehicles. Des Moines police said after the shooting, police detectives carried out five residential search warrants and six vehicle search warrants and recovered six firearms. That's the latest from around the nation. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Lauren, for our national update. Now let's go to our last break of the night. But stick around because we still have Clever in the studio to give us all the sports updates. I know what you're thinking. Any basketball and hockey information. And learn about a fascinating first-year student at Quinnipiac who has a talent unlike most students on campus. Stay with us. Good job. I need a new career. Well, I've been there. I've been there. I've been there. I wasn't happy with what I was doing. After high school, I didn't have a plan. I just wanted to start working. I got laid off twice. But you got to keep going. You just need the right skills. Find an apprenticeship. I found a two-year IT program. I found a medical course online. I'm now a consultant in the tech space. You have more options than you think. You can do this. You will find something. You will find something new. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made home ownership happen. Homeschooling yourself on loans, beefing up your credit score. So I'm pre-approved. You were like, yes! Sorry. Color coding listings, ticking boxes, and flushing every toilet in a 20-mile radius. Home sweet home. You aced house hunting. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Honey, what I think you need is a socket wrench. I played JV basketball. I'm sorry. I don't think it looks right. This is good, and it's all is good, it all, baby. Is it really all good? If you love me enough to routinely test your handyman skills, not to mention the strength of your marriage, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. I'm going to call my dad. Clever Strice joins us in the studio to talk about what has been happening with Quinnipiac Sports. Clever, how's it going today? 
Thanks, Katie and Keith. It is officially playoff season, so let's take a look at the latest stories in Quinnipiac winter sports. Up first, a massive upset in round one of the MAC men's basketball tournament in Atlantic City, New Jersey last night. The 11 seeded Bobcats defeated the 6 seeded Marist Red Foxes by the score of 77-52. Leading the way for the Bobcats was graduate forward Jacob Ragoni, who played one of the best games of his collegiate career. Ragoni put up a career-high tying seven three-pointers and scored 26 points. Desi Jones nearly secured a triple-double, and Matt Belonk recorded 18 points in the route over the Marist Red Foxes. The Bobcats will turn its attention to number 3 seed Sienna Saints for the MAC quarterfinals, which is set to tip off this Thursday night at 7 p.m. Switching gears from the hardwood floor to the ice, the women's ice hockey team is set for the big dance on Thursday as the Bobcats will face the Syracuse Orange in Round 1 of the NCAA Tournament in Columbus, Ohio. Coming off of a loss to Colgate in the ECAC semifinals, Quinnipiac was able to secure a bid to the tournament in last Sunday's selection show. This will be the first meeting between Syracuse and Quinnipiac since 2012, with Quinnipiac holding a 5-3 all-time series lead. The winner of the game will face the top-seeded Ohio State Buckeyes on Saturday in the NCAA quarterfinals. Coming up for the big game, the puck drop is set for Thursday this evening at 6 p.m. While the women's team gets set for Syracuse, the men's ice hockey team will begin a campaign of its own in the ECAC playoffs. The top-seeded Bobcats will face the eighth-seeded St. Lawrence Saints in the ECAC quarterfinals this Friday at the People's United Center. Quinnipiac will look to get a measure of revenge over St. Lawrence as the series will be a rematch of the 2021 ECAC championship game where the Bobcats were upset in overtime by the Saints by the score of 3-2. The winner of the best of three series will advance to the ECAC semifinals the following weekend in Lake Placid, New York. Game one will start this Friday at 7 p.m. That's all for sports, so let's now head back to the main desk. Thank you, Clever. Quinnipiac students have a wide variety of talents, but there is one first-year student who has a very unique hobby that can be heard all across campus. Tim Malone has the story. You may have heard some music while walking down Bobcat Way. It's not your imagination. It's freshman harpist Lydia Grabel. Lydia has been playing the harp for 11 years, originally starting solo with private lessons before eventually joining her high school's orchestra. I felt like the harp, it just it had a quality about it that none of the other instruments showed me. But there was such beauty and grace to it that, that I just fell in love with instantly. So I try to do it as much as I can, but making sure since people, they're all busy studying and getting to work, especially for upcoming exams. So I usually practice in my dorm room, but if I want to be able to you know, let everyone hear it and share that experience, then I'll bring it out here. <laughs> In a wide variety of reactions. There's a lot of the people that are excited because it's something new and that's one of my favorite parts of you know walking around. People can experience it, just how it, like how much I love the harp I can share that with other people. is a part of the Quinnipiac Chamber Orchestra and she hopes to find gigs and other freelance work next year when she can have a car on campus. You can find Lydia playing in the Troop Resident Hall, Buckman Theater, and the Quinnipiac Orchestra. Lydia, play us out. For Q30 News, I'm Tim Malone. Thank you so much, Tim. So I actually got to go with Tim to interview Lydia, and we got to look at her harp, and it is such a beautiful instrument. It is so unique from all of their instruments that I've seen, and I just think it's so cool that she brought it to campus and wants to share it with her friends and her students that live in her residence hall. It's amazing. I wish I could do it. I wish I was there, but you gotta I love that story. I, I know. It was a great story, and I wish I could play the harp. Um, I played flute in middle school, but that is all. I have not played any other instrument, and I don't think I could pull it off as well as she does. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight. Don't forget to stay updated throughout the week by following us on Twitter at Q30 News, visiting our website Q30TV.com, and downloading the Q30 TV mobile app. From Village 610, where Keith and I both live, Keith, myself, and everyone behind the scenes says, Good night, Bobcats, and thank you. <laughs>